Amen. All right. The title of the sermon this evening is Last of All. Last of All. I'm going to be preaching on the topic of the final rejection of the nation of Israel. The final rejection of the nation of Israel. And I'm going to be dealing with, here in the, the first few minutes, the root cause of the misunderstanding of the nation of Israel and how they are treated today and what their status is today, present day, in 2019. I want you to look with me here in Exodus chapter number 19, verse number 1. The Bible says this, In the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, <clears throat> the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Verse 5, pay close attention. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me and above all people for all the earth is mine verse 6 and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation and then it says this these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel now I want to start by saying this 99.9% .9 of Christianity today support the physical nation of Israel that is founded in the area uh, roughly of where biblical Israel was located. 99.9%. .9%. You know, and unfortunately, really, if we were to look at saved Bible believers, those that are true Christians, right? You know, it's 99.999% .999 of them. I mean, that is one of the, it seems to be, one of the core beliefs of being, you know, an IFB today is that you must love Israel more than you love your mother. You must love Israel more than you love anything else on this entire planet. But I'm going to be preaching to you today a very foundational truth. And the only reason why people are confused about this today is because of the false teachings of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism has crept into, unfortunately again, the groups of saved Bible believers, those that are actually the children of God. <clears throat> and one of the core teachings of dispensationalism, and almost uh, uh, the, the, the purpose of dispensationalism, it seems, is to provide a little piece of the pie still in present day for the physical nation of Israel. Now, the foundational misunderstanding comes here from Exodus chapter number 19. This is where you're going you're gonna to unbrainwash the, uh, the Zionists of today. When you speak to people that are just in full support of the physical nation of Israel, and they, they, they believe with every ounce in their body that the nation of Israel is still God's chosen people, do you know what they always say to you every time? God made an unconditional promise to Abraham. God made an unconditional promise to the nation of Israel. How many times have you heard that? Every time anyone wants to argue on behalf of the physical nation of Israel today still being the apple of God's eye or still being, you know, God's holy nation, peculiar people, that's what they'll always say every single time. They say God made an unconditional promise to the nation of Israel. Now, I want to begin by saying this. If you're familiar with grammar, there's actually such a thing in grammar that is called a conditional sentence. Is everybody familiar with that? Do you remember what that is? It's something that's called a conditional sentence. And in a conditional sentence, there are two parts. A clause, right? It's just a statement, not necessarily a full sentence. You know, you can have multiple clauses in a sentence, right? So, a, a in, within the conditional sentence, there are normally two clauses. Basically, there are two clauses. Both of these have to be present. Number one is the conditional clause. And do you know what it always contains? You know what word it always contains every time? If. if. That is what causes it to be a conditional clause. And do you know what the second part of that sentence is? It's called, it's then, but it's called the uh, result clause. That's what that's called. So you have the conditional clause 
Within the conditional sentence, you have the conditional clause and then you have the result clause. And what that means is if, right? If is the condition. If this condition is fulfilled, then this will be the result. That's what that means. So obviously, if the condition is not fulfilled, what? This will not be the result. This result will not come to fruition. That's the point. That's the whole point of a conditional clause. If I tell my children, if you clean your room, you can have ice cream. If they don't clean the room, do they get ice cream? I mean, that's extremely simple. No, they are not getting ice cream, right? I want you to look with me at verse number five. We saw there at the end of verse number four, God commands it, uh, Moses to speak these words to the nation of Israel. Now look at verse number five. Now therefore, if, notice that, there's your conditional clause, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then, notice the result clause, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So notice we have our conditional clause where he says, if, and what is the condition for the nation of Israel? They must keep his covenant. What is his covenant? It's the law, right? They have to keep his covenant. They have to keep his covenant. And what is going to be the result of that? Then, he says, ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Now, do they get to just be a peculiar treasure above all people even if they don't keep his law? It's like we can do whatever we want and we're a peculiar treasure unto God. Of course not, right? Same concept of, hey, my children do not get ice cream unless they clean the room, right? Look at verse 6 again. Here's the statement. We're going to see this in the New Testament again here in a moment. Actually, towards the end of the sermon. It says in verse 6, And ye shall be, this is still a part of the result clause, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. So that's going to be the result but this is a conditional statement. So we can see very clearly just from one verse really alone. If we look at verse 5 and 6 in Exodus chapter number 19, it was the covenant that was made with the nation of Israel an unconditional promise, was it? No, it was not. Isn't this extremely basic and extremely simple? So it makes you wonder, there are so many things that, that Christianity is so screwed up on today. Very simple teachings in the Bible. It shows you the importance of reading your Bible on your own and actually doing some independent thought and being a Berean, right? You know, search those things out and see if they are so, right? That's what we need to be doing as Christians and not just, just eating whatever is given to us from the pulpit. You need to be, everything that I preach, you need to be thinking about and reading and looking up and seeing whether that is so or not. Now, I want you to go ahead and turn. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 13. So we can see by just a simple reading of the very covenant that comes out of God's mouth, it is a conditional promise that is given when He gives the covenant. It's a conditional promise. Hey, if you do this, then I will do this, and you will be this unto me. So many people, what they do is they confuse the covenant that was originally made with Abraham with this covenant here. And they are not the same, my friend. The Bible is very clear and it actually differentiates numerous times in the New Testament and even I can show you places in the Old Testament where the Bible differentiates between the two covenants. There is the, the, the Old Testament, which is the law, or the Old Covenant, which is the law. And then there is the New Testament, which is grace, which is the gospel, right? The, the New Testament is a conditional, it is a conditional covenant based upon faith. But once you have faith, you know, that's an unconditional covenant. Because you know why? Because you're saved forever after that. You can never lose your salvation. So there's one condition. Once you fulfill the condition, put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, now it's unconditional. There's nothing else left to do because you've done, you've fulfilled the one requirement or the one condition to that covenant. But what people do very often is they confuse the promise that was made to Abraham, which was the gospel, the Bible says. And I'm not going to read those particular verses, but go back and read Galatians chapter number 3, verses 1 through 5 and 6, and it clearly tells you that 
when God appeared unto Abraham, he, in Genesis 15, he preached unto him the gospel. But just to prove that that covenant and that promise specifically that was given to Abraham was not given to the entire nation, what you're probably already familiar with, Galatians 3.16. You've heard this many times, but one more time. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So notice that the promise was given to Abraham and to his seed, singular. He tells you that that, that, that seed is Christ. And he goes on further there to explain that he didn't say seeds as of many. Saying that this does not automatically just apply to everyone. The covenant's given to Abraham and his seed. So it's very, very clear. Not only that, the very next verse actually differentiates between this covenant and the law or the old covenant. It says in verse 17, And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So notice that the promise or the covenant that was made with Abraham is differentiated. In the very next verse that he ex after he explains, hey, that was not made to a full nation. That was not made to the whole nation. Then he differentiates between the law, which was the covenant we read about in Exodus 19. To further prove that, Exodus 24-7 says this, and he took the book of the covenant, that's the law, and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. There's them giving lip service to fulfilling the condition, right? Then it says this in verse 8, And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So notice, that's another covenant that is distinct. It said 430 years after. So you have the covenant that was given, that was the covenant of grace to Abraham. The promise of the gospel, which was a promise of the Christ to come one day. That covenant was given, and then 430 years after that covenant was given, then we have the law, the covenant that was given to the nation of Israel. And when that covenant's given... To the, to, for them to be a holy nation, for them to be a peculiar people, if they, they keep the law, it says that he sprinkled them that day. So there is a, a distinction between these two covenants. They are not the same covenant. And what did we see about the covenant there that we saw the law when he sprinkled the people? What did we see? What type of covenant was it? Once more, it was a conditional covenant covenant wasn't. It was very clearly a conditional covenant. So what oftentimes people that would be considered Zionists or people that have been duped, <coughs> excuse me, into just supporting the physical nation of Israel still to this day and they've been deceived into believing that, that God's promise to the nation of Israel is just continues on today. What they don't understand is that the covenant that was given to Abraham was not the covenant that was given to the nation. Those are two entirely different covenants. And if they could understand that there was a condition, well then they could understand that, hey, that means that God can pull the plug on that covenant if they don't fulfill that condition. So, we can see undoubtedly that that, that covenant was the law that was given to them. And we see all throughout the Old Testament, if we were to fast forward into the New Testament and look back into retrospect, just if we were standing on the soil at the time when Jesus came, that's what we're going to look at right now. And we were to look back to the Old Testament. Did they keep that covenant? Never, did they? They broke it constantly, continually. And what is he doing? He's bringing upon them the curses that he said, I'll bring this upon you if you do this. And he's continually kicking them out of the land. The Bible talks about <clears throat> every prophet that's sent to him. They just kill. They reject. Right? And then God ends up moving them out of the land for sometimes 70 years. And then he has mercy on them. Right? Many times he ends up showing mercy on them and saying, hey, I'll give you another chance. You want to you you try to... You fulfill the condition, I'll give you another opportunity. But I'm going to pr be preaching tonight on the final rejection. So there was times when he rejected them temporarily. But I am going to prove to you without a shadow of a doubt from Scripture that there was a final rejection of the nation of Israel. And it came about when Jesus Christ came. And like the title of the sermon, the Bible tells us that last of all, he sent his son. So the very last opportunity that the nation of Israel had was when the son of God came. And everything hinged on their exception or rejection of 
the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see that. I want you to look here with me at Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 13. We're going to start off very slow, but I want to point out to you that, that Jesus actually began warning the children of Israel about this possibility, about them being cast out and rejected very early on. In some verses maybe that you've never noticed this before, but I want to show you some comparisons here. And we're going to kind of be going back to the Old Testament, New Testament a little bit. But I want to show you that he made some allusions to the possibility uh, that if they were to reject him, that God would ultimately reject the physical nation of Israel. I want you to look with me here at Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 13. <clears throat> it says this, <clears throat> Ye are the salt of the earth. Now who is Jesus preaching to? What type of audience? He's preaching to the Jews, isn't he? He's preaching to the Israelites, the nation of Israel. Ye are the salt of the earth. And then he says this, But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? And then it says, It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Now we see here he's speaking to the nation of Israel. And first of all he says, Hey, you're the salt of the earth. But then he goes on to say, But if the salt hath lost its savor. Now what was the nation of Israel's glory? Like it says in Jeremiah chapter number 2 or 3. The Lord says he, he is their glory, right? They've traded their glory for that which doth not profit. He says, talking about uh, uh, idols and things, right? So he was their glory. So if the, the salt has lost its savor, if it, if it no longer is worshiping the Lord and it's, and it's rejected the Lord, Jesus says this, wherewith shall it be salted? And then he goes on to say, it is thenceforth Good for nothing. Now I want you to hold on to that statement right there. Good for nothing. And he says, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Now, that statement also afterwards we saw. There few, I want to point out three statements here. And I want you to try to keep these in your mind. This is a pretty famous verse, so that shouldn't be too difficult for you. Number one, I want you to remember the statement, good for nothing. Now salt has a use, right? Right? It has a flavor, a savor. But if it no longer has that savor, is it profitable to you any longer? No. You don't need it, do you? Right? So God had a use for the nation of Israel. We see that in the very next verse. Verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, <clears throat> but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was meant to be a light unto the world. If they were no longer a light, or if they no longer had their savor, they were no longer profitable for God. That was the whole purpose why they were set up. They were not set up for themselves, which they began later on to think. And if they, if they weren't doing their purpose, or weren't fulfilling their purpose, well then they're no longer good for God, are they? They're no longer profitable for God. We see later on after good for nothing. So that's the first statement I want you to hang on to. Then it says this, but to be cast out. Now, I want you to keep that in your mind. I'm going to be making some uh, 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 scripture, scripture references with that. And then here's an obvious one. And to be trodden under foot of men. Does, now, does that ring bells and make you think of specific scriptures throughout the New Testament? I'm going to show you something here in just a moment. I want you to go back to Jeremiah chapter number 13, verse number 4. I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter number 21, verse number 24, where Jesus speaks of a coming judgment to the nation of Israel for their rejection of him. It says in verse 24 of Luke 21, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. Speaking of the nation of Israel, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In the book of Revelation, it talks about being trodden underfoot. That exact phrase is actually used. So notice it's going to be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles. And notice also they're let, being led captive into all nations, right? What does that think of? How about maybe being cast out, right? So I want you to go back to Jeremiah chapter number 13, verse number 4. We're going to see the other time where this phrase good for nothing or profitable for nothing is actually used and what it's talking about when it is employed. Look at uh, Jeremiah chapter number 13, verse number 4. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. He says this, Take the girdle, that's a belt, take the girdle that thou hast got, which is upon thy loins, and arise, go to Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole of the rock. So I went and hid it by Euphrates, as the Lord commanded me. That's a, a river, of course. Verse 6, And it came to pass after many days that the Lord said unto me, Arise, go to Euphra Euphrates, and take the girdle from thence, which I commanded thee to hide there. 
Then I went to Euphrates and digged and took the girdle from the place where I had hid it. Now watch this. And behold, the girdle was marred. What does that mean? It means it was cut up. It was ripped up, right? It was torn up. He says it was marred. And then, it's, and then he says this, it was profitable for nothing. I want you to notice, notice that statement. He says it was profitable for nothing. Why? Because a girdle or a belt has a purpose, doesn't it? It has a use. And if it's no longer capable of holding your pants up, what, what are you going to do with it? It's, it's not profitable. You're going to take it and you're going to cast it out. You're going to cast it away. You don't need it anymore, right? It's not fulfilling its purpose. Look at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, After this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. So notice what he says he's going to do. He's going to mar Jerusalem. He's going to mar, their, like he says, Judah. What does that mean? He's going to tear them up. He's going to hurt them or harm them. He's going to punish them. That's what he's saying. He's going to mar them. Why? Look at verse number 10. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle which is good for nothing. So notice the other time when we find this phrase good for nothing. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jerusalem. And he's saying that, that why? Because they're not fulfilling their purpose that he has for them. Look at the next verse, verse number 11. For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, watch this, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord. And then he says that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory. And then he says, but they would not hear. So I want you to notice also in verse number 11, he talks about just like a girl cleaves unto a man, I had the nation of Israel cleave unto myself. What is he saying? He goes on to explain it further. He says that the whole house of Israel was unto him. He says, uh, the whole house of Israel saith the Lord that they might be unto me for a people and for a name. So that they might be unto him for a people, right? But what does he say that what type of condition or state is the girdle in. He said it's good for nothing. It's been marred, right? It's good for nothing. So what's he going to do with it? He's going to cast it away. He's not going to use it, right? He's no longer going to use it because notice the last phrase in verse number 11. He said, I did all this that they might be a people unto me, but then he says this, but they would not hear. What's the implication there? They're not going to be my people any longer. I'm going to mar them. He's saying I'm going to kick them out. I'm going to cast them out. What's very interesting is just this, this uh, uh, comparison. If you just flip over, you probably don't have to flip over, but look over there at Jeremiah chapter number 12. Look at verse number 7. He says this, I have forsaken mine house. I have left mine heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. <clears throat> so he's speaking about the nation of Israel. And this is, of course, currently at this time they were still his chosen people. Look at what it says in verse 8. Mine heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest. It crieth out against me, therefore have I hated it. Mine heritage is unto me as a speckled bird. The birds round about are against her. Come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field. Come to devour. Look at verse 10. Many pastors, watch this, have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. What takes place at the time when the trotting underfoot of the Gentiles happens? It says that it's, it, it's made desolate, right? That had to be a boy, right? It, it was made desolate. He said that he makes the city desolate. Now, one thing that I want to point out to you as well is that he says in verse 7, I have forsaken mine house. I have forsaken mine house. So, was it still his house at that time? It was his house, right? He says, I have forsaken mine house. So currently, of course, under the Old Covenant still, it is his house. This is a very elementary point in the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. This is a very important point, very important scriptures to understand. I want you to notice that he makes that statement. I have forsaken mine house. I want you to go with me now to the New Testament. Go to Jeremiah, or I'm sorry, Matthew chapter number 21. Matthew chapter number 21. <clears throat> right here in Matthew 21 is where we start seeing in clarity the coming rejection of the nation of Israel. <clears throat> it's going to get clearer and clearer. I want to point out one thing first though that ties in with what we just looked at. But we're going to be jumping around here, Matthew 21, Matthew 23, right around here. I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 21. I want you to look at verse 12. When Jesus goes into the temple. It says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and brought, bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Then verse 13, And said unto them, It is written, 
My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Let me ask you this question. At this time, was it still God's house? What does it seem like? Seems like it is, because he's, he's applying this scripture that was quoted from the, he's quoting it from the Old Testament. He's saying, it is written, my house. Saying, I'm not allowing this in here because this is God's house, right? So at this time, was it still God's house? It was. I want you to turn over, flip over just a couple of pages or a couple chapters at least. Go to Matthew 23. I want you to look at something Jesus says in Matthew 23. It's, it's, it, it may seem small and unimportant, but it's actually very significant. Look at verse 36. <clears throat> Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So he speaks of, of, of the, uh, the rejection and what they had done unto the prophets in the Old Testament. And he talks about the coming punishment. But he says this in verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem! That thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So I want you to notice how Christ is, he, Christ is uh, sorrowful, and he's weeping over the nation of Israel. If we look at another passage, the book of Luke actually tells us that he wept here. But uh, if we look closely here, we can see that he wants them to accept him. And he would have gathered them together. He would have done blessings and good things for them. But it says that they would not. Now we're going to look at the result of that. So this is, this is the last of all he sent his son. Right? He's coming to them and what does he know is, is about to happen? That they're going to reject him. Notice that he referred to it as God's house. In the Old Testament they referred to it as God's house. But look at verse 39. He's speaking of Jerusalem. He says this. For I say unto you, I'm sorry, verse 38, it's verse 38. Behold, watch this, your house is left unto you desolate. So notice kind of the change in language there. What does he say? Behold, and he says, your house. Why? Because he is pronouncing the coming rejection of the nation of Israel. That's what this entire passage is about. He said, I came to you and I offered this opportunity to you. And when I came, you know what happened? You rejected me. So you know what the result of that? Your house is left unto you desolate. Now, you could say, oh, well, he's not talking about the temple here. Neither was he in Jeremiah. He was talking about his vineyard, and he specifically said Jerusalem. That's what he said in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter number 12. And in Jeremiah chapter number 12, he kept saying, mine house and mine heritage. But do you know what the Lord said when he looked at Jerusalem at this point? He said, your house. Your house is left unto you. And what did he say? Desolate. The exact language he used in, Jer in Jeremiah 12. He said it would be made desolate, didn't he? In Jeremiah chapter number 13, what did he say was going to happen? In Jeremiah 13, he said that, it, that, hey, when this belt is, it, it cleaves unto me for now while it's good and it's profitable and it has, it has a use and it can hold my pants up. But if it loses that, that you know, purpose, if it loses that ability to fulfill its purpose, you know what I'm going to do with it? I'm going to take it off and I'm going to cast it away from me. I'm going to cast it forth. Makes perfect sense when you compare that with Matthew chapter number 5. Because what happens? Hey, Jerusalem, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? And then he says, it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. That is the exact punishment, impending punishment that he is pronouncing upon them here at the end of Matthew chapter 23 as well. He goes on to speak about it in further detail in Matthew chapter number 24 just to further prove that. Now what's the reason? Because they were good for nothing. They weren't profitable unto him. We're going to see the rejection of the nation of Israel in much more clarity now. I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 21 verse number 33. Matthew chapter number 21 verse number 33. <clears throat> it says this, Hear another parable. This is Christ speaking, of course. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another. And stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first. And they did unto them likewise. Then it says this, But last of all, he sent unto them his son, 
saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men. And he will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. Verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, did ye, never read in, did, ye, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, that's Jerusalem, that's the Jews. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So what we see in this parable basically is an overall an overall look of the history of the nation of Israel. You have the husbandmen, right? Or you have, I'm sorry, the Lord of the vineyard. That would be God. And he lets out, you know, his vineyard to husbandmen. It's the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. He gives them, you know, all of these great blessings. He gives them all of these things. Hey, you're going to be a holy nation unto me. You're going to be a peculiar people. Hey, here's the word of God. Here's the temple of God. They have all of these great things. They have all of these precious things. They're a peculiar treasure unto God. But what happens? He sends servants unto them. They may be disobedient, and he sends a servant unto them to go preach the, the word to them. What is it? A prophet. Maybe, you know, you know Isaiah. Maybe Jeremiah. Maybe, you know, Zechariah. You could, you could name many of them. Servant after servant. Hey, we need some fruit. We need some fruit, husband men. We need some fruit. And what do they do to the servants? They take them and they beat them. And half the time they kill them. And you know what happened? There came a time when God had had enough. He was very long-suffering. He was very merciful with the nation of Israel. But there came a time in the history of the nation of Israel... Where it says this, look at verse 37. Let this set in very clearly. But last of all, he sent unto them his son. Who's his son? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's very key words there. But last of all. What does that mean? This is their last chance. Last of all, he sent, the, he sent his son. He sent his son unto them. And what did they do to his son? They took him and they killed him. And then they prophesied their own, uh, uh, basically their own, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Consequences, if you will, or punishment. They consequy their own destiny. That's the word I was looking for. They prophesy their own destiny. Because notice what he says. Jesus asked them. He's asking the Jews. He's asking those of Jerusalem. And he says, When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And these bunch of fools say, they say this. They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. He, and then he says, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him, which shall render him the fruit in their seasons. Ding, 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 ding. That's exactly what he's going to do. You know what he's going to do? He's going to come and he's going to miserably destroy those wicked men. That's what he's going to do. And you know what else he's going to do? You're right, old Jerusalem. He's going to let out his vineyard. That vineyard, that holy nation, the, the, being the peculiar people, he's going to take it from them and he's going to let it out to another nation, to another group of people. Look at what it says in verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. There you have your extremely clear verse to help you understand the Old Testament, New Testament, the nation of Israel, the Christians. There's your answer. That can't be any clearer. Therefore, so as a result, because you last of all, you had this opportunity when the Son was sent unto you and you are going to crucify Him. Therefore, as the result of that, He says, 
I say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Let me interpret the parable for you. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So do they have the kingdom anymore? No. The kingdom of God is no longer there with the nation of Israel. They, what does that mean? They are no longer the peculiar people. They are no longer the nation of God. That, a kingdom and nation is used interchangeable all throughout the Old Testament. That's what it's talking about. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. And then he says, and given to a nation. Notice how it's used interchangeable. And given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. <clears throat> I'm going to show you, I want you to keep in mind that idea. Uh, actually, first let's go to Isaiah 5. But I want you to keep in mind the idea of something being good for nothing. Right? Or being unprofitable. Go to Isaiah 5 because this is not only uh, just strictly a New Testament uh, teaching. <clears throat> we saw in the book of Jeremiah, but we can see almost this exactly in the book of Isaiah. This is spoken of. This same, almost this exact same parable and what would take place. Look at Isaiah chapter number 5. Look with me at verse number 1. It says, Now will I sing to my, my well-beloved a song of my well-beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. I want you to notice that. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine. Do you remember that part in the parable? How he dug and hedged and he did all that. See the preparations? And built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Who is this speaking? It's God. It's the Lord. You know what he's talking about? Hey, let me tell you a parable, Jerusalem. That sound familiar? Let me tell you a parable about my vineyard. And this is what happens. In this case, it brings forth wild grapes. Are they useful? No, they're still not useful is the point. They're unprofitable. That's the same point. Look at what it says next. Verse 4, what could, I, could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done, it, done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be, watch this, trodden down. It shall be trodden down. You see the great consistency here? So even all the way back to the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was warned. Verse 6, And I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned. What's waste? Desolate. Nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Notice it's going to grow up briars and thorns. So how much of the nation of God are they today? None! The blessing has been totally taken from them. The kingdom of God has entirely been taken from them and it's given to another nation. Amen. Not only that, the, na the nation, the kingdom is not there any longer. That land brings forth briars and thorns spiritually. Right. It is not a nation of God. It is not a kingdom of God. And all of these Christians, they want to look at the nation of Israel and they want to say, oh, God bless the nation of Israel. That is not God's nation any longer. The kingdom of God no longer dwells there. It is spiritually a bunch of thorns and briars is what it is. You have a bunch of God and Christ rejectors over there that hate the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't love the Lord. They hate Him. They spit when they say their name. And all these Christians are so duped into thinking, oh, they're all the holy people. They are not the holy people. They're about the heathen, a bunch of heathen and Gentiles and pagans over there. That's who they are. They are not the nation of God. The kingdom was taken from them. Right. Got a bunch of thorns and briars over there. That's what they have. That's what they are, a bunch of thorns and briars. Amen. They want to go dwell in that vineyard? Be my stinking guest. Be my guest. Go bring forth wild grapes. The Lord's not going to eat of them. He doesn't want them. Amen. He doesn't want them anymore. The nation of Israel has been rejected by God. Right. Over and over and over again, he says, Hey, you're no good to me. You didn't bring forth fruit. No good. You, the belt, you don't work, it's marred, cast it out. Right. Talks about the salt, cast it out. What does he say over and over again? How many times have we seen trodden underfoot? Trodden underfoot. Trodden down. Trodden down of the Gentiles. Over and over and over again. You know why? Because <clears throat> this is the prophecy of the last chance that they got. You know what happened? Last of all. Let that set in. 
That is game over there. Just that one sentence. Last of all, he sent his son. Now, if they would have accepted him, then we'd maybe have an argument here, right? But they rejected him. And then he goes on to say that the kingdom of God is taken from you. I want you to go now with me uh, back. We're going to go back to Matthew chapter 21. So like I said, <clears throat> in clarity, you know, he starts out in, in uh, the book of Matthew and Jesus, it, early on in his ministry, he speaks of the, the, the coming rejection of the nation of Israel. But he, he goes <clears throat> into clarity later on in the book of Matthew and in his, his ministry in general. We saw him cursing the nation of Israel, uh, or cursing, uh, yeah, standing before and, and, and cursing the nation of Israel, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, right? Look here in Matthew chapter number 21. I want you to see this again, verse 18. Notice that there's no hope any longer. That's what I want you to get. Last of all, he sent his son. There's no hope for that physical nation to be God's chosen people anymore. That was their last opportunity. Look again, we're going to see that same concept here, Matthew 21. Look at verse 18. Verse 17, And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, and it says this, And found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward, now watch this, forever. And then it says, and presently the fig tree withered away. Now, if you would notice, we went to the Old Testament after we left Matthew 21. That parable is told here just later in Matthew 21, making that connection in your mind. But <clears throat> anyone that's familiar with the Bible, over and over and over again, the nation of Israel is likened unto a fig tree. And they're likened unto an olive tree, and they're likened unto a vineyard. We see here... He comes to the tree, and what does he not find that it's bearing? What does it not have? It doesn't have any fruit. What would you call a tree that's not bearing fruit? Exactly. It's good for nothing. What's the purpose of a tree? A fig tree. To bring forth figs. He goes to it, and you know what? It's good for nothing. It's not fulfilling its purpose. What did he want when he sent his son? He wanted it to bring forth what? Fruit. Right? He actually, when they responded, they said, one of the Jews, they said, He will miserably, miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. So what was the problem? It wasn't bringing forth fruit. What's the issue with the fig tree? The nation of Israel. It's not bringing forth fruit. But I want you to notice the statement that's made. One more time. Verse 19, he says, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward, and then look at that, forever. Last of all, he sent his son. That was their last opportunity. The physical nation of Israel does not have the capability to bring forth any fruit today. That physical nation. They don't even have the ability. Do you know why? Because Christ cursed them. That's what we saw in Matthew 23 when he stood above, you know, on the hill and he looks down at the nation of Israel. He already pronounced, he knows, of course, the end from the beginning. He pronounced their fate and that was what was going to happen. They were going to be cast out and trodden underfoot of men, right? That was what was to come. That physical nation will never bring forth fruit in the eyes of God ever again. It's not possible. You know why? Because last of all, he sent his son. And you know what he didn't get? He didn't get any fruit. It was good for nothing. The debate is over, my friend. It is as clear as can possibly be. I want you to turn now. Let's look at, uh, go to Luke chapter 13. We'll look at this <clears throat> again from another angle. That's why it said also, if we had looked at, we did look at this earlier, Matthew 21, verse 43, it makes perfect sense. He says, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. He's, he's got another tree, right? He's got another nation that he's going to use. So we're going to look at Luke chapter number 13, verse number 6. Luke chapter number 13, verse number 6. We'll see this again, the same concept being taught. Luke chapter number 13, verse number 6. <clears throat> he says, He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree, had a fig tree, planted his vineyard. 
A certain man had a fig tree planted his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Now notice this is a parable this time. Before it was actually Christ walking up to a fig tree. It's similar to this, right? He didn't plant it or anything, but he went to the fig tree, and it says, and he sought for fruit. He was hungered, it says, right? He says, and he, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and watch this, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. What's that sound like? Maybe it sounds like he sent one servant, he sent another servant, he sent another servant. But furthermore, there's even a cooler and even more of an interesting uh, uh, um, you know, symbolism here. How long was Christ on the earth? For his ministry that he was sent to, and who was he sent to? Israel. He was sent unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. For how many years? Three. And what does he say? He says, Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. Hmm. That was actually at the end of his ministry when he approached that fig tree. Is that the end of three years? And what did he not find on that fig tree? No fruit. You know what he did to the fig tree? He cursed it. <clears throat> it says, I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after after that, thou shalt cut it down. So notice what the, what the end result is. They have an, a last opportunity, right? Like last of all, he sent his son. But notice what the end result is here. What is it? Is the fig tree there still? Does it get just the opportunity? Hey, just stand over there and see maybe next year. Hey, maybe next year. Hey, maybe one more opportunity. Hey, maybe, you know, if it, if it stands for 10 years, it might bear fruit. Maybe in 1948 it might be able to bear fruit. Is that what's going on? No, he says, Let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it. And then he says this, And dung it. Do you know what has happened to the kingdom of God? And the, let's, the kingdom of God has been taken from them. And you know what happened to the nation of Israel, the physical nation of Israel? God, he dung it, if you will, Right? It's a pile of poop now. You know what you do in something, a big hole like that oftentimes? times? You put manure there. That's what he's talking about. It's made dung. It's not, why? Why? What's the reason? Because it's good for nothing. It's not profitable anymore. It's unuseful. Right? Luke 14, look over at uh, Luke 14, verse 34. Notice the uh, dung, right? Keep that in your mind. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be se seasoned? Does it sound familiar? We read about this, right? Look at verse 35. It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dung hill. Look at that. Just randomly thrown in there. It says, but men cast it out. And then he says this. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Because why? What is he talking about? He's talking about the physical nation of Israel. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number uh, 1. 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 1. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 8, verse number uh, 10 says, And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we see this all over, over and over and over again, the rejection of the nation of Israel. Now, can the nation of Israel, those that are of, you know, roughly the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or are a part of the nation of Israel, or are, you know, uh, of the religion of Judaism, <clears throat> can they still be saved? Of course. Of course they can. You know, like in Romans chapter number 11, I'll read that too, because that's pretty important to make sure that I clarify that. In Romans chapter number 11, the question is actually asked, 
I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. And he says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. He goes on to explain that he's saved. And he is of the line of Israel. So, has God just cast them out in the sense that they can never have the opportunity of salvation? No, that's not what happened. But you know what he did do? He took the kingdom of God from them and he gave it to another nation. That's why they can never bear fruit again. As far as the physical nation. Because they are no longer in God's eyes a legitimate vineyard. They are no longer in God's eyes a legitimate you know, they're not legitimately the people of God or, or the nation of God or the kingdom of God. That's been taken and given to another nation. We're going to look and see what the Bible teaches about that other nation and who that nation is. Look here at 1 Peter chapter number 2. <clears throat> look at verse number 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient the stone which the builders disallowed. Who's that talking about? Somewhere the Jews. They're the builders. The same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. Verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. So notice he was making a contrast between who? The builders. Who's the builders? The Jews. It's the Jews, right? And saying what? They're not the people of God. And he says, but, but you, he talk. He says, ye, right? But ye. Those, he's speaking to people that are not of the physical nation of Israel. I'll prove that further to you. But it says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look at verse 10. Which in time past were not a people. What does he mean? They were not a nation. Proving what? In time past, they were not a people. Who was a people in time past? The Jews. So these are Gentiles he's speaking to. And he tells them, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Just to further prove this, if you're interested in whether or not this is truly Gentiles, cross-reference uh, Romans 11.30 afterwards, with that last statement where it talks about which had not obtained mercy. But notice he says, which in time past were not a people. He says, but now you are a people. Now, if you paid close attention there in verse number 9, you would have noticed in Exodus 19 that these exact titles were given in Exodus 19. He says, but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. At the time of the covenant giving with Moses, when, that, when they were enjoined unto God with that covenant, they were the holy nation of God. They were a peculiar treasure and a peculiar people of God. God sent unto them prophet after prophet. They rejected and they killed him. You know what happened? Last of all, he sent his son. They brought forth no fruit, they were proven to be good for nothing. That was their last opportunity. You know what happened? They were rejected. They had no salt. Their light was not shining, right? So they as a whole and as a nation were rejected. And it says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. They're no longer a holy nation. They're no longer a peculiar people. So who is this nation? Well, he tells you right there, which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God. We look in Revelation chapter number 7. We see all those that are raptured and they're in heaven and they're singing, they're praising God. He says, who are all these, right? You know what he says he sees? He sees them of every kindred and every nation and every tongue. Amen. That is the people of God. Amen. That's the true nation of God. That's the true, that's the new covenant, the New Testament people of God. Amen. That peculiar treasure, that peculiar people, that holy nation in the New Testament are all of those, like it says right there, all of those who believed in that stone, who put their trust in that stone. And you know, the others were disobedient. And this is a cool example as well 
Uh, people think when they see obedient or disobedient, they think, well, that means you must be you know, uh, being good or being bad. But if you look closely, this is kind of off topic. If you look, though, in verse 7, he says, we even look at verse 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So what do you have to do? You have to believe on him. Verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which, look at this, be disobedient. So what are they not doing? They're not believing. So see, disobedience does not mean, oh, I'm, I'm not keeping the laws of God. No, the commandment is repent and believe the gospel. You know, stop not believing and put your faith in him. Anyone who puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if they're part of that physical nation of Israel over there and they put their faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they become a part of the nation of God. They become a part of the holy nation, of the peculiar treasure, of the peculiar people. Amen. People want to try to say, hey, I'm the people of God, I'm the nation of God. There's many people that do this. It's not only, you know, Israel, black Hebrew Israelites. There's a lot of people that say that and do that. They're just the, the newest, you know, sh you know, show in town, freak show in town, really. There's many people that say this. But you know what? Why, 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 you know, uh, be so foolish when it's offered to you freely? Why, you know, just make up, the, people just desire to have just this inherent, this, this, this inherent, you know, uh, uh, special type of, of, of treasure within themselves, right? But just, you know, because it's, because it's people glorying in themselves, glorying in their own fat flesh. You know what you need to do? You just need to put your faith in the stone. And then you can really and truly in real life and stop, you know, playing fairy tale. You can really be a people of God. You can really be a part of the, the holy nation and the peculiar people. It's, it's, a, it's a nation that's made up of all kindreds and tongues Amen. and people. That is the true people of God. And it's a basic elementary truth that many people are confused about. But those are a few very good passages you can turn people to. And so many Christians nowadays are so confused. This is one of the major distinctions. This is probably the major distinction between the Old Covenant and the New Testament. The times of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's one of the major distinctions of those time periods, if you will. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We